and let's turn back to Psalms 119. Psalm 119. Last two Sunday nights, we've been studying a um, little series entitled Deepening Your Love for God's Word. So this will be the third message in that series. And we'll be looking at verses 17 through 24 of Psalm chapter 119. I appreciate you allowing me to be able to go uh, to Live Oak Baptist Church this morning. We had a wonderful service and uh, probably the most um, orchestrated by the Lord service I've ever been in. You could tell that. You could tell that God had worked all the details out and He prepared uh, the message to go along with the singing perfectly and really everything that happened in that service was of the Lord. Um, I ask you to continue praying. Uh, there was one person who raised their hand who did not know Christ um, and, and actually a middle-aged woman and uh, at least by profession or by coming down and letting us know she did not accept Christ as Savior. So continue to keep her in your prayers. But uh, regardless, at the end of the day, we know that what people need to be saved is to realize that they're a sinner. And we know by her raising her hand that God was dealing with her. And same thing tonight. We know that God is ready to deal with us according to His Word. And tonight we're looking at how to deepen your love for God's Word. Verse 17 of Psalm chapter 119 says, Deal bountifully, bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. Verse 20. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word, dear God, that speaks to us. It's living, Lord, and it's truth. And God, I pray that you'd help us to draw from it tonight, dear God, as a fountain of waters, Lord. I pray that we would drink from your word, dear God, and that our thirst would be quenched. God, I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, help us, Lord, to be receptive, but also to be responsive to your word, dear God. And I pray that you touch each of our hearts, Lord, with that which you'd have us to hear, apply it to our lives in your own personal way. And God, just help us, Lord, to continue to grow our love for your word, dear God, and our love for you. Lord, we give you the praise for tonight, and whatever you decide to do, meet with us now. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. How to deepen your love for God's Word. I'll quickly review a few things that I think some of the main points we've taken from verses 1 through 16 already. In order to deepen your love for God's Word, you must walk in His way, seek Him with, all your whole, seek him with your whole heart, hide His Word in your heart, and give your whole being to His Word. Your whole being would be your body, soul, and spirit. And these are some of the highlights of things we've looked at in the last 16 verses. But tonight we look even further at verse 17 through 24 to find what else the psalmist says we can do to have a deepened love for God's Word. You know, the Christian life is an endless pursuit of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to pursue Jesus Christ, we have to pursue the Word that He left us and uh, we have to walk in the way that He left us. Verse 17 says, Deal bountiful, bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. You know, I think there's a key thing here just in one word about how to deepen our love for God's word, and I think it's the S word that says servant. You know, many of us don't want to be a servant. Many of us want to live according to ourselves, and we want naturally others to serve us. And we want positions that are high in our workplace and positions that are high in church because sometimes we feel like uh, we're worthy to be served. But the Bible here says, Deal bountiful, bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Now we remember the psalmist here. He's already told us in the word that he is a blessed man because he has sought the Lord God with all of his heart. He's walking in the ways of God. Uh, he's doing the right things. He's living the right way. He's turning to the right word. And we think that he'd be in a pretty good position not to be in a servant. But here in verse 17, he says that he is the servant of God. And what I have written down is that a servant does not live for self. 
He lives to serve and please His Master. The first thing tonight that we draw from verse 17, if we're going to have a deepened love for God's Word, if we're going to ask God to help us to live and to keep and hold fast to His Word, the first thing we must do is be willing to be a servant, willing to be lowly, willing to be obedient, and willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ wherever He would go. A servant does not live for himself. And so as we in the Christian life, we are not commanded to live for ourselves, nor should we live for ourselves. We shouldn't live for our own desires. We shouldn't live for our own goals. We shouldn't live for our own benefit. We should live to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And wherever He leads, we should commit to go and follow Him. And verse 18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Not only does he say, deal bountifully with thy servant, but he also says, open thou mine eyes. Open thou mine eyes. You see, our eyes must be open to understand God's Word. We know that to be true. How many of you have ever opened up the Word of God and you begin to read and you had no clue what you're reading about? Or maybe you were reading through a book and you got into a chapter. Or maybe you read the whole book of a, of a, of a Bible chapter or of a Bible book and you come to the end and said, I, don't, I didn't get anything out of that. What in the world was I supposed to see? Well, we know that we can find Christ in every book of the Bible. We know we can find the great principles which God has put in place for us to live by. So if we missed them, that's not God's fault. That's our fault. And the thing is, when we come to God's Word, we must ask God to open our eyes to understand His Word. Because the mind itself cannot understand. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter how, what kind of education you've uh, pursued. It doesn't matter how many years you've been a Christian. If you do not pray and ask God to open your eyes according to His Word and what He'd have to show you, then you're doing all in vain. You're just reading a bunch of words on a paper unless you're asking God to make known His truths unto you. Our eyes must be open to understand God's Word, but also to love God's Word. If we're going to have a deepened love for God's Word, it's only going to come by God opening our eyes to see the greater truths in His Word. You see, many times I can read the Bible and I can read Psalm 119 and say, man, that's some good stuff. But if I just say that's some good stuff and God doesn't really touch my heart with it, then something's wrong. Many of us, we gather and we listen to preachers on Sundays and Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, and every meeting of the Global Baptist Church, we hear preaching of God's Word. And there are many good sermons, not lifting up men, but we've heard uh, many good sermons from this pulpit, from various people, from evangelists, from pastors, from different people, from missionaries. We've heard great sermons, but if all we do when we leave is say, man, that was good stuff and we just leave and doesn't, don't let it change our life, then that's not God's problem, that's our problem. Because we have not asked God to open our eyes, but to show us the wondrous things. To let the truths that we see change our hearts and we find that our eyes must be open to love God's Word. You know, the Bible is a living book. Just as our Savior is a living Savior, God is a living God, the Bible, God's Word, is a living book. And every time we read it and every time we come to it, God desires to show us and to teach us and to guide us through it. And we'll actually talk about that in a little bit later, but the Bible is our counselor. It is our guide. And every time we come to the Bible, we can learn more about what God has to say and we can learn more about what God gives us to do. You know, there's many times I sat in Bible classes in college and I heard a man teach and, or even heard people preach and said, man, I've never seen that in the Bible and that's some good stuff. And then later in a few years or a few months later, I begin to read God's Word. And you know what? I find something different in it, something that applies to me that day and something that, that helps me and gives me more spiritual food. Well, the Bible is a living book and our Savior is a living Savior. And if we're going to have a deep in love for, our, for God's Word, then we must ask God to open our eyes. In verse 18, He said, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You know, not only is he asking just for God to reveal truth, but he's saying, God, show me the wondrous things of thy law. You know, in the Lord School of the Bible, we've been going through, we've just finished the books of the law over the last few weeks. And many times when you're reading the books of the law and reading God's commandments, you can just get lost in the commandments. You can get lost in the numbers. You can get lost in the accounts. You can get lost in the tribes. You can get lost in all the things that God was doing to set in order. But can I tell you that the psalmist plea to God here was, Open thou mine eyes to behold the wondrous things and even those commandments and those laws and those numbers. And if we're just going to read God's Word as a historical account, 
then that's all we're going to get out of it, history. And if we read God's Word just for a scientific account, all we're going to get out of it is a scientific, like we read a textbook. But if we come to God and ask Him to open our eyes, that is when God will show us the wondrous things even out of the law we've been going through that's hard to understand or hard to perceive or hard to receive the wondrous things of God. But every principle and practice in the Old Testament Every practice in the Old Testament points to a principle that God has given us in the New Testament. Verse 19 says, I am a stranger in the earth, hide not thy commandments from me. It says, I am a stranger in the earth. I want to take you real quick to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13. Many of us know Hebrews chapter 11 as, the, as what people call the hall of faith where we learn that by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith Enoch, by faith Abraham, by faith David, by faith all of these people walked with the Lord, by faith Noah. And when we come to Hebrews chapter 11, we get to verse 13 and the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 15, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. What we find as we look back at Psalm chapter 119, we find that the psalmist is saying, I'm a stranger in the earth. What he's saying is just as my fathers were a stranger in the earth, just as they were sojourners in this earth, just as they were a people who didn't deserve God's blessing and God's grace and to be chosen as God's people to be led into the promised land. So he says, I am a stranger in the earth Hide not thy commandments from me. You know, I think we can relate spiritually to this, this plea and this cry. Because when we were born into the earth and to the time that we asked Jesus, confessed our sins and believed in Him with all of our heart, from the time we were born into that time where we decided to follow Christ and ask Him to forgive our sins, we were strangers to the law of God. We were strangers to God. Why? Because if you think about a stranger today, it would be like someone walking up to our, your house or walking up to these doors and we have no clue who they are. And most of the time, people say, beware, stranger danger, right? Watch out for strangers because they might be thieves or they might be evil men. And you're not always going to just open your door to a stranger to let them come into your house. But what did God do to His chosen people? They were strangers who were sojourners and God chose them and God led them and God made a promise with them. And even the men like Abraham who God made a promise and a covenant with, God gave strangers a blessing. God gave strangers grace. And people who did not deserve God's goodness received it because they believed in Him by faith. Me and you, yes, we were sinners before we were saved, but you know what we also were? Strangers between God. We were desiring a country. We were desiring a covenant. We were desiring Christ, our Savior. I've got written here down uh, the plea of, of the former, the old fathers, the plea of those in the Old Testament. Their plea was, hide not thy country. The psalmist's plea was, hide not thy commandment. Their plea was, hide not the land. The psalmist's plea was, hide not thy law, only in mine heart. So notice the difference in the pleas. Back then, Abraham and them pleaded for the country of God, pleaded to be led out of Egypt and into the promised land. That was their plea. Lord, lead us into thy country that thou hast promised us, that thou hast given us. But now the psalmist is saying, not lead me into a country, not lead me into a place. We've, we've already been led into there, but lead me into thy commandments. He says in verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. And today our plea is this same thing. Lord, hide your word not from me except in mine heart. Remember what Psalm chapter 119 verse 11 said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The only place we are to hide God's word is to hide it in our hearts. You know, I think about that little song we used to sing, and I don't even really remember the words right now, but the idea and the image is in my head, but hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. We don't hide God's word from the world. God doesn't hide His word from us. But the psalmist's plea was, Hide your word in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Let me memorize it. Let me meditate upon it. Let it be a statute to me. Let it be my counselor, my guide, and always in my thoughts. And in everything I do, let the word of God go before me. 
He says in verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth, hide not thy commandments from me. Verse 20, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgment. My soul breaketh. You know, uh, I hope the next time we come together we can look at verses 25 through 32. And there are three different occurrences where he says, My soul and then a verb. My soul doth something. I'll take you to them. I won't explain them to you. But verse 25, he says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. And then in verse 20. Eight, he said, my soul melteth for heaviness. Now we remember from last week that our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotion. Our soul is our inner man. It's our makeup. It's who we are at our core. It's who Dylan is, or it's who your name is. It's your mind. It's your thoughts. It's the way you think. It's your will. It's your desire. And it's your emotions, how you act and how you react to the things of life. And the psalmist here is pleading out and he says, My soul breaketh, my mind breaketh, my will breaketh, my, uh, my emotions break for the longing that it hath unto thy judgment at all times. And you know, in order to have a deepened love for God's Word, we have to find our place in verse 20 with God. We have to come to the point in our life, and it's not us coming to a point, it's not us working to a certain way, but it's God bringing us to the point, us asking the Lord to open our eyes and to break our hearts for the longing of His Word. To deepen our love for the Lord and for His Word, we will have to have a longing for His Word. A longing so deep that our souls break for God's Word. You know, not just in the trials of life, but in everyday living, we ought to long for God's Word. Uh, that's the desire through this, through this little series we're taking is for us to have a deep and love for God's Word, to long for it, to cleave to it, to cling to it, to love it so much that we always want to be around it. We always want to be in it. We always want to hear it. We always want to read it. We always want to hide it in our heart. We always want to memorize it and meditate upon it. We must come to this position where we can say, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Verse 21 says, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Notice the contrast between verse 21 and verse 19. In verse 19, he's humbling himself by saying, I am a stranger in the earth. He's saying, I am not worthy. I am a stranger, but God, you have brought me into your family. You have brought me into your presence. God, you have saved me, and God, I have faith in you. But in verse 21, he compares the flip side of people. Not the humble people, not the people who come before the Lord in humility, but he says, thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed. You see, there are some people who are not willing to serve the Lord God. There are some people who are not willing to step down off their high pedestal and, and submit to what God's Word would have them to do. What do we find about those people? They are cursed. They are the cursed people. Remember back in verse 1 of Psalm chapter 19, we, had, uh, we learned what a blessed man was. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So we have the people who are humble, who come as servants before the Lord, who walk in God's Word. And you know what? They are the blessed men. They are the blessed women. They are the blessed people. But then on the flip side, we have those who are proud and those who walk their own way and those who think that they are good enough and that what they can do is righteous. But the Word of God says in verse 21, Thou hast rebuked, thou hast turned away, thou hast scolded the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. They are proud and as a result of their pride, they err or they turn from the commandments of God. They are not walking in the law of the Lord. And we want to be the blessed men and women. We do not want to be the proud. We do not want to be the cursed. Verse 22 says, Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Here again, I hope we connect, connect it the next time uh, we come together uh, in this study, but uh, he says, remove from me reproach and contempt in verse 22, but in verse 29 he says, remove from me the way of lying. Uh, it, the Christian life is, is, a constant, is a constant life of God removing things from our life and God bringing things into our life. Now our focus is not on what God must remove, our focus is on what God must bring into. 
As we follow the Lord, we will automatically turn away from sin. And as we seek the Lord, He will then cause us to remove naturally away from the things we must be removed from. But here in verse 22 is not a, a plea to, for God to remove sin from His life. It's from God to remove reproach and contempt. And what that is, is people are bashing Him. People are talking about Him. People are despising Him. He is facing some form of persecution. And we find that even more in verse 23 when it says, Princes also did sit and speak against Me. There are people coming against here the man of God. And if you're going to live the blessed way of the blessed man, if you're going to walk in the law of the Lord, if you're going to have a deepened love for God's Word, if your eyes are going to be open, if your soul is going to break for God and His Word, then you best believe you will have people coming against you. You best believe that there will people be people coming against your church. You best believe that there will be people coming against you specifically, individually, in the workplace, and some people even in the church who are against you. I've had this thought recently. It's been, been in my mind this week, and uh, I wish I was better prepared to write it out in a way that I know it would make the most impact. But I've had the thought about people who really do something for the Lord. Now, I don't mean people who have the bit largest ministries and write the most books and sing the greatest songs and just make an impact on the entire world. But I mean people who at their core, regardless of how many people know them, how famous they are, who make a difference for the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these people have one thing in common. They are pioneers. They are always moving forward for God. They're always taking the next step. They're always doing something to reach the lost. They're always finding ways. They're always going out. They're always witnessing. They're always in the presence of the Lord. They're always in His Word. And they have a different spirit about them. But can I tell you what? Every person like this you find does not just, even if they come to fame and prominence, even if their name is well known in Christian association, they always have many, many, many people against them. You know, I think about Pastor Clarence Sexton, and I've been thinking about him lately. It's coming almost a year uh, to a year anniversary of his death. And uh, I think about his life and how many times, how great of a man he was and how he started a Bible college and had a great church and wrote many books and helpful resources created like the School of the Bible and the Sunday School material that we are studying here. So many great resources, such a great man, such great influence in our world. But I think of the great, the great uh, people, amount of people who spoke against him and went against him. And I think of the great amount of people who went against Temple Baptist Church and how many terrible things you hear about it in Knoxville and surrounding areas. But can I tell you why that is? Because they were a church who went after people. They were a church who, were, who was doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. They were a church who was not going to be content with just sitting in a pulpit, listening to a sermon every week. They were a church that was about the Lord's business. Now, Temple Baptist Church is not a perfect church. Indeed, they did things wrong. Indeed, people in their church congregation made mistakes. But they were a working church. They were a soul winning church and still are today. And people like that and churches like that are going to be the ones who get spoken against the most. I was thinking about these 650, roughly if not more, 650 uh, gospel candy tracks and bags that we passed out the other night. And you know, many people, I didn't see anybody, maybe you had an experience or an encounter, but I didn't see anybody, I, I figured we might honestly, but stand up against us and buck, buck up against us as we were doing that. But can I tell you, uh, we made some effort to evangelize uh, the children and families of our area. Can I tell you that there will be people who say, I'm so glad of what you're doing and that was a great deal, but there will also be many people as a result of that that will begin to take a stand against Global Baptist Church. And there will be many people that will begin to take a stand because of what's preached by, and from this pulpit by Pastor Kyle. There will be people and already are that take a stand and speak against us and God's work here because it doesn't fit their ears and doesn't fit what they want to hear. And nobody likes somebody who's doing something better than they are. Nobody likes, many times in the Christian, I'm getting off a little bit here, but I think it's it's a good thing, and I believe it's of the Lord. Nobody likes, we can all relate, a, a try hard, right? You get in a workplace, and somebody just always trying hard to impress people. But we must not mix up try hards in the Christian faith. No doubt there are people who are pastors and who are missionaries who are try hard just to get people to see them. But there are many pioneers of the faith who are out there doing something for God that a lot of us look at and say, they're just a try hard. They're just doing too much. But they're the ones that are winning the loss. They are 
are the ones that are seeing people saved. They are the ones who their church is growing and God is doing a great work and serving God is going to come at a cost. It's going to come at a sacrifice. But can I tell you that our plea will be the same as the psalmist's plea. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. We will be, as long as we continue, the ones who say, I have kept thy testimonies. And this reproach and this contempt and these people that are coming against me, it's all for the glory of the Lord. Why? Because they're not walking in God's law, but I have kept thy testimonies. I have kept thy word. And keeping God's word is going to come at a cost but it's a cost that is worth it. Verse 23 says, Princes also did speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Boy, great princes, great kings, great people of high authority in that world, of the world of that time, they spoke against God's word and they spoke against God's man and they spoke against God's work. But you know what? This humble man says, but thy servant here again did meditate in thy statutes. And I told you last, uh, last Sunday night, what is going to get you through? What is going to help your heart throughout the week? It's not one message. It's not one chapter. It's not just reading the Bible each day. But it's meditating God's Word in your heart, just as the psalmist said earlier, at all times. And then we come to verse 24. And verse 24 reads, Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Now here we finish off with a great statement. And remember when we, when we see words like testimonies and we see words like law and we see words like commandments and statutes, all of these and judgments, all of these are talking about the Word of God in its entirety. The Word of God that He would have held at that time was all of these things. We could say many things about the Word of God today, but we just sum it up by saying the Word of God. But the Word of God is filled with testimonies. It's filled with uh, it's filled with judgments, it's filled with statutes, it's filled with commandments, it's filled with law, it's filled with all these wonderful things. But here he chooses to say, by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thy testimonies also are my delight. You want to find joy in life? Do you want to have de delight? Do you want to live the victorious Christian life? Well, it's in the endless pursuit of Jesus Christ. It's in, as we said a few weeks ago, uh, the Christian life and Christian education are about pursuing the mind of Christ, about developing the mind of Christ in ourselves, in children, and in others. It's developing the mind of Christ, being more like Jesus Christ, or as we say, Christ's likeness. And he says, thy testimony or thy word is my delight. It's what I joy in. Can I tell you that if you come to the place, if we come to the place where we can have a deep and love for God's Word, then we'll have more joy. We'll have a natural delight, not only for God's Word, but for everything that God has given us to do. We will have delight and joy in the Lord. But also, he says, Thy testimonies are also my delight and my counselors. Many people today, even many Christians today, uh, are looking for counselors and they're looking for guidance in life and they're looking for a preacher to tell them what they need to do or what they're looking into parents to tell them uh, what to major in. And I'm thinking of many different things running through my head, but all of us are seeking counsel at some point in our life. All of us are looking for the next step. What should we do about retirement? What should we do about our job? What should we do in the church? What should we do here and there and this and that? And every way we look, we're all seeking counsel. But can I tell you what? Ultimately, where should I count our counsel come from? It comes from the Word of God. Now, I'm not bashing anyone who has to seek medical help because there are people mentally who do need uh, to seek out good godly counsel and Christian counselors. But can I tell you, the first place you must turn is to God's Word because not only will it bring you joy in life, but it will bring you counsel. It will bring you guidance. And God's Word guides us. It's a living book. And it, only, it was not only given to guide the people of Israel. It was not only given to guide Paul. It was not only to given to, to, die, to guide the disciples after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the Father. But it was given to guide us. And it is guiding us today. God's Word is a living book. And here's what I'm trying to say is that many people don't have delight. Many people don't have joy. Many people are depressed because of circumstances in the world. And there are times when people need to seek medical help for those things. And again, I'm not bashing that to those who are listening here or online, but the Word of God can heal depression. And the Word, of God can, the Word of God can keep you off of medicine, depression medicine, and the Word of God can keep you out of a counselor's chair because if we, find, if we have a deepened love for God's Word, it will bring us delight in this life 
even in the midst of people speaking against us, and it'll bring us counsel even when it's hard to understand what we're going through. Can I tell you tonight, we must have a deepened love for God's Word. And the only way that we can do this, the only way we can have a deepened love for God's Word is by God opening up our mind, opening up our heart, and opening up ourselves to Him. And that's a decision that we must make tonight. Notice verse 30. We'll finish off with this statement. He says in verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Lord willing, we'll talk more about that later, but notice what he says. I have chosen the way of truth. You have a choice tonight. You have a choice tonight if you'll follow the Lord or if you'll follow the world. You have a choice tonight uh, to deepen your love for God's Word. It all begins with this statement, I have chosen the way of truth. Tonight, will you choose the way of truth? As we uh, bow our head and close our eyes, let's go to the Lord in prayer as our musicians become and begin to play. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this message. God, we're seeking you tonight for a deep in love for your word. We're asking that you would open our eyes and our hearts, God, to it. I ask your God that you would touch and move and bless right now. I ask your God that you would bring those to the altar of sacrifice, Lord, who need to come and, and deal with you. But Lord, I ask even further more than that, dear God, that you would be with those who are even listening online, dear God, that you would help them to have a deep and love for your word. Help us together as a church to take a strong stand for you, regardless of who comes against us. Help our pastor, dear God, to do the same. Help us to lift him up. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we ask that you move and work at this time. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.